Okay, so this is the lecture for chapter 10. We're starting still in the adolescent period. We're just going to talk about their social world. So adolescents have to actually achieve their own identity because they can't rely on their parents for their lives. So this is a very crucial time in their life. In Erickson's terms, they are on the fifth stage, identity versus role confusion. So they are really trying to figure out who am I, but there are so many roles that they can play. There are so many roles they can perform out there that they get confused as to which route they should take. So an identity consists of oneself, viewing yourself as a unique individual. So you have your own role, you have your own attitudes, your own beliefs, your aspirations, your dreams, what you want to do with your life. And identity achievement is the term that Erickson used for attainment of this identity. So they figure out who they are. They figure out what they want to be. They actually accomplish their own identity. So the individual understands who they are. They are unique. And they can kind of reconcile their past with their future. Role confusion <clears throat> is also referred to as identity diffusion. So this is when the adolescent doesn't know or really care what their identity actually is. So they're not going to really try to do anything or try to figure it out. They just really don't care or they have no idea what direction to take. Foreclosure is the term that Erickson used for premature identity formation. This usually happens if an adolescent takes on whatever their parents do they start to work for the family business. They take on society's roles, what the society values as opposed to what they think. So society thinks this is wrong, so now they think that's wrong. They don't question it. They don't analyze it. They don't look at how they actually feel about it. They just accept it. A moratorium is a term used for when adolescents actually postpone making these huge decisions, making these identity achievement decisions. But it's socially acceptable. Going to college, for example, is a common moratorium that adolescents will take. When you start college, oftentimes you don't know what your role, what your major is going to be. You kind of just fill out that general studies course of action. And then later on, you figure out what you actually want to do. Or you may change your major 50 times before you finally figure out what you want to do. And that's okay. And it's socially acceptable. So when they're confused, they're not really focused on what they need to do or what they want to do. Foreclosure kind of helps them avoid any confusion because they just take on what they're supposed to take on, what their parents do or what society values. They don't explore anything new or different. And then again, moratorium, when they to go to college, they might join the army or navy, they might join a band, you know, that kind of thing. So we have four areas of identity formation, religious identity, political identity, vocational identity, and then sexual identity, <clears throat> which also goes along with gender identity and gender dysphoria. So religious identity, what you identify with religiously speaking, oftentimes it's similar to what your parents are. Sometimes you may be more devout or not as devout, but it's often the religion that you grew up with, so to speak. Political identity, usually again, similar to your parents, but sometimes they, adolescents decide to go independent and they don't really make a choice and they don't identify with a political party a particular one. They're not Republican or Democratic. They're independent. Vocational identity is your occupation. So before, back in older times, this kind of used to be figured out at a younger age than it is now. Oftentimes it takes years to establish now. And like I said, when you start college, you may not start out knowing what your occupation is going to be. But Eventually, you'll get there. We're more generalist now, kind of flexible and dynamic. And we kind of 
figure out what we want to do at a later age after going to college and such. Sexual identity, gender identity, oftentimes we question gender roles. Again, going back in older times when a vocation was kind of figured out rather early on in life, there were certain gender roles that people had to play. So women stayed at home with the family, didn't work. Males went to work, took care of the family, supported the family. But that's actually slowly starting to change now. We are starting to question roles and females can kind of do anything they want to do. Males don't necessarily have to be the breadwinners. They can be stay-at-home dads. And then we also have transgenders. When gender dysphoria occurs, the individual is not comfortable in their body. They're not sure what they're seeing and they don't know how to reconcile with what they're feeling inside. So oftentimes it leads to issues, unfortunately. <clears throat> to work or not to work in high school. This little graph here shows the scores of 8th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders who work over 20 hours a week, work under 20 hours a week, aren't employed but they wish they worked more than 20 hours a week, they're not employed, but they wish they worked fewer than 20 hours a week, and they're not employed and don't want to work at all. The interesting thing is that adolescents who work over 20 hours a week, or even just wish they worked over 20 hours a week, have lower grades than adolescents who work fewer than 20 hours a week or don't work at all. So inter grades tend to fall because in employment, especially when you're working over 20 hours a week, often interferes with homework and school attendance sometimes as well. Before, when adolescents got a job, they were often saving for college. Um, now it's actually kind of changed. Now some want to work because they want to have things that their families can't afford. Sometimes they have to work to help pay the bills. So times have changed, but the bad thing is that the impact on academics is still pretty evident. So adolescents want to establish their own self. They are social beings, so they want to interact with others. But they need others to kind of validate themselves. So they need others to validate who they want to be when they grow up, so to speak. Adult, ob adult influence isn't as obvious here. So they care less about what adults think and more about what their peers think. Conflicts with parents, we have this drive for independence that the adolescents want. And then we have this drive for control that the parents want. So adolescents and parents often conflict because of the fact that the adolescent wants to be independent, but the parent still wants to control them. The conflict typically peaks in early adolescence, but actually it's a sign of attachment because the parents still want that control, not distance. So it's actually kind of a good thing. Bickering kind of involves petty, peevish arguing. It's usually repeated, it's usually ongoing, and it's very actually considered to be normal. You know, you argue about what you're wearing, you argue about what's for dinner, you know, that kind of thing. Things that don't really matter. Neglect, on the other hand, can be harmful and unhealthy because even though teenagers want their independence and act like they don't need their parents anymore, the bottom line is they still need their parents. So neglect can actually be very destructive. So we've already talked about authoritative parents and how that's kind of the best approach to take, theoretically speaking, and uninvolved parents is the worst approach to take, and that's kind of where the neglect comes in. More important than conflict is closeness of the family, which has four aspects. Communication, so how well do the parents and teens communicate with each other? Can they talk openly with each other? Can they have conversations about anything? 
support? Do they rely on one another? Do they have each other's backs, so to speak? Do they know that the other will be there for them? And communication and support are very helpful and essential to family closeness. Connectedness, connectedness has to do with how emotionally close they are. So, <clears throat> sorry, do they, you know, tell each other they love each other? Do they give each other hugs? That kind of thing. And then control. Do parents encourage adolescent autonomy or do they limit it? Do they want their adolescents to have more freedom or do they, you know, are they strict? Do they make them do what they say, when they say, how they say it kind of thing? So again, connectedness is healthy. Some extent of control is going to be healthy. But these four things working together really tell us how close a family can be and how good their relationships are. Parental monitoring is, as the name implies, the parents knowing where their children are, what they're doing, who they're doing it with. Positively, you have a warm, supportive relationship, so you know where your kids are, you know who they're hanging around with, you know what they're doing. And the negative side, if you're overly restrictive and controlling, oftentimes the children will rebel. So making sure you have a good relationship with them is going to help them become confident and you're going to have a mutual respect going back and forth. You don't want, um, you know, to be too restrictive and too controlling of your children. Children and adults who communicate and care about each other, obviously are going to turn out the best. The worst is when parents make the child feel guilty. They make them they try to make them feel threatened and show their gratefulness by saying that they're not going to support them anymore. They're not going to love them anymore. And of course, this is, you know, a horrible route to take. It's kind of psychological warfare almost. Well, if you don't tell me where you're going and who you're going, you know, with, I'm not going to be here for you anymore or I don't love you anymore kind of thing. So <clears throat> with parental monitoring, Communication is really the key. Trust is key. You want to make sure your children trust you and you trust them. And you have to give them some freedom in order to do that. Peer pressure. Peer pressure can be good or bad. Peer pressure provides encouragement, basically, to conform to your friends, what they're doing, behavior, dress, attitudes. It's usually considered negative because usually we think of their peers trying to encourage them to drink or smoke or do drugs or anything else, but it actually can be positive. You know, you can have feel peer pressure to get good grades because you don't want to stand out from your friends if they're all getting good grades. Study groups, that kind of thing. So peer pressure can actually be a positive thing. But it kind of helps them navigate through adolescence. Um, again, parent relationships could, should kind of set the example for peer relationships. So how well you get along with your children kind of sets the tone for how well they're going to get along with their friends. Peers can be more helpful than harmful, especially in early adolescence. Again, teenagers are less susceptible to peer pressure. So it's not as bad as we think. Oftentimes we think that, oh, their friends are all doing drugs, their friends are all drinking, and we don't want them to do that. We don't want them to be like that. You know, they're going to drag them down kind of thing. But like I said, we have things like study groups and, you know, when they're in the same classes, helping each other out. This is actually a good thing, and it can be a good thing. Technology brings friends together. Texting, of course, instant messaging, social media, Facebook, video games, and chatting on the video games. But we also have a health monitoring now when you can talk to a doctor by Skyping and things like that. So technology is one of those things that it's kind of 
bringing friends together during this time of adolescence when they can't always physically be together. Deviancy training is destructive peer support. So basically one person shows the other the ropes, one person shows the other how to rebel and do what they're not supposed to do, like these two boys jumping off the roof into the snow. Um, even though there is snow, they can get hurt. Oftentimes, suicide is one of those things that if there's a suicide of a family member or a friend or even an admired celebrity, the adolescent suicide rate will increase. And that's one of those things that we really need to talk to our kids about. Okay, how do they get along with their friends? Selection, teenagers select friends whose values and interests are like theirs. So they look for friends whose value and interest they have in common. They get rid of friends who go other routes. So for example, my daughter used to hang around with a little girl who started dating boys at a very young age. And my daughter was not a fan of that. So my daughter stopped hanging around with her and started hanging around with other friends who weren't dating boys yet. So, you know, that's kind of selection. Facilitation, peers facilitate both destructive and constructive behaviors in one another. So good and bad. It makes it easier to do the wrong thing and the right thing when you have friends around. So it kind of helps individuals do things that they won't do by themselves. So like I said, this could be a good thing, like study groups is a big one. Could be a good thing, but could be a bad thing. So it depends, you know. So with selection, the, the teenagers are kind of choosing friends. With facilitation, they're kind of chosen. So the peers kind of say, hey, come, let's do this. Male and female relationships start to evolve in adolescence. Usually it starts out with groups of friends that are one sex or the other. And then it moves to a loose association of girls and boys in a crowd. And then the group will get smaller. And then couples will form with private intimate things happening. So in childhood, we start out avoiding the opposite sex where only wanting to hang around with groups of the same sex, but by adulthood, you're attracted to the opposite sex. So it's kind of a gradual sequence here. So you start out with only your sex friends, and then you start out with big groups of boys and girls, and then it gets smaller and finally smaller to a couple. <clears throat> First love typically occurs in high school. It's more likely to happen in girls. Exclusive commitment is often difficult. It's more closely related to the emotional state than the actual interactions that are happening. So romantic relationships are not chosen for the traits themselves, but for the traits that their peers kind of admire. So you don't necessarily like somebody because you like them. You like somebody because they're popular and your friends think they're really cool kind of thing. So if the leader of a girl's group pairs with the leader of a boy's group, other group members tend to pair off, like football players and cheerleaders kind of thing. Sexual orientation, you can have attraction to the same sex, the opposite sex, or both sexes. It's really fluid during teen years. Culture has a huge influence. Some cultures, it's still not acceptable yet. Cohort also have a powerful influence. Back in the silent generation and baby boomers, it was not as acceptable as it is today. So now we have acceptance happening. And things that used to be against the law are no longer against the law. So many date other sex to hide how they're feeling inside. Um, but hopefully that's becoming more accepted nowadays. 
adolescents usually have really strong sexual urges, but they don't know a lot about pregnancy and disease. Their sources are the media, the internet, and music and magazines to learn about sex. So what you want to make sure that you do if, you know, when you're a child or when you have children, I mean, is make sure you have good relationships with your children because your children are more likely to talk to you about sex and ask you questions if you have a good relationship with them. And research actually shows that children who talk to their parents about sex are less likely to have sex earlier than children who don't talk to their parents about sex. So there's a lot of parents out there who think, well, if I talk to them about it, then they're going to want to do it. And research shows that's not the case. Research actually shows that they get curious, and when they can't find the answers they're looking for, they try to get them on their own. And that usually doesn't work out too well. So parental communication is going to influence the adolescent's behavior. A lot of parents have no idea what their adolescents are doing, and so they wait to talk about sex until their child already has a steady relationship. That's not what you want to do. You want to talk about it with them as soon as possible. When parents are silent or they forbid you to do something, adolescent sexual behavior is going to be influenced by their peers. So oftentimes, if parents forbid them to do something, they're going to probably try to do it. The timing and content of sexual education in schools varies by states and communities. Some programs begin in the sixth grade, others start senior year. Effective sex programs have to include emotions. So you do role playing and have discussions with parents and things like that. It's usually very limited though. They kind of learn about it and the research again shows that those who are educated are actually less likely to end up with unwanted pregnancies and use protection and or they're more likely to use protection and they're less likely to have sex early on. So talking about it isn't the taboo that we used to think it was. Unfortunately, a lot of adolescents go through depression. There's a difference between depression and clinical depression. Depression, you have less confidence, more depression. You can gradually increase your self-esteem. There's a general trend from childhood to adolescence where you slowly start to get an increase in your self-esteem. The dip at puberty is found all over the place, but there are gender and ethnic differences. So puberty is really the key there. Once puberty hits, all the hormones hit, that rush hits, self-esteem kind of drops. Self-esteem kind of drops. Usually it's short-lived. Everybody has bad days. So you, just because you're having some bad days doesn't mean you're depressed. Clinical depression lasts two weeks or more. So to be diagnosed, you have to have it last for two weeks or more. You have to feel hopeless, worthless. You're lethargic. You have no energy. And it's usually a combination of a bunch of different stressors. People with the 5-HTTLPR receptor actually are more likely to be clinically di diagnosed with depression than those that do not have it. But again, the length of time is one of the crucial diagnostic tools there. So studies find girls have much higher rates than boys, almost twice as high. The cause may be biological, but we're not really sure actually. Cognitively speaking, rumination is a big one. This is more common in girls and can contribute to it. And basically it's repeatedly thinking and talking about past experiences. I have a friend who constantly, every time we talk, has to talk about high school and what we did in high school and what we did in our early 20s. And they're constantly thinking about this and talking about it, even though you know we're both married with children now. She constantly ruminates and talks about the past and what we used to do back in the day. And, you know, it's kind of a cognitive explanation for why girls get more depressed than boys, because girls do this more often. And if you're constantly living in the past and thinking about the past, it's kind of hard to move forward and look forward to the future. 
Suicide is one of those things that I said we need to make sure we talk to our children about, especially if it happens. Thinking about suicide is relatively common. So suicidal ideation is just thinking about suicide. Completed suicides are not usually common. Parasuicide is an attempted or failed suicide. And cluster suicides are several suicides committed by members of a group in a short period of time. There are some cults that have gone through cluster suicides, for example. But parasuicide is more common than a completed suicide. So this is attempting suicide, basically, but you don't succeed. And as I said, suicidal ideation, just thinking about suicide, is relatively common. But actually attempting it is less common, and actually completing it is even less common, thank goodness. The suicide rate among male teenagers in the U.S. is four times higher than the rate for females. They usually use lethal means, and the availability of these lethal means is easier for the male culture. Male culture kind of looks down upon those who attempt suicide and are not successful at it, which is kind of odd. But as I said, the method is really what contributes to the success rate, I guess you would say. Males have a tendency to shoot themselves. They take violent methods to kill themselves. Females swallow pills or hang themselves. Girls also tend to let family and friends know that they're depressed, but boys are almost ashamed and embarrassed of it, so they usually won't let people know. Delinquency. Rage and resistance. Moody adolescents can actually be both depressed and delinquent. So we have this assumption that out of control adolescents are just rebelling and there's kind of no hope for them. But there really is. We have done research and we can help out of control adolescents. They can get help and be rehabilitated. So adolescent rebellion can also be a reaction against parental restrictions, which we've talked about multiple times with the authoritarian parents who think they're the final authority. The prevalence and incidence of criminal action is actually higher in adolescents and we have different types. So a juvenile delinquent is just anyone who breaks the law and they're under 18. But then we have adolescent limited and life course persistent offenders. Adolescents limited offenders break the law until they're 21 and then they're done. Life course persistent offenders start in early adolescence and offend throughout their life. So how do they get there? Stubbornness can lead to defiance, which can lead to running away. Shoplifting can lead to arson and burglary, and bullying can actually lead to assault, rape, and murder. So some things that we really don't think about as being, you know, horrible can lead to other things. So they're kind of the gateway. Drug use becomes widespread from age 10 to 25, but then decreases. Drug use before age 15 is actually the best predictor of later drug use. Nationally speaking, though, we have different rates, even in nations with common boundaries. Partially because of laws, but in the U.S., three-fourths of high school seniors have tried alcohol and half are current drinkers. Drug use among adolescents has decreased since 1976. We have a decrease in synthetic narcotics and prescriptions, but increase in vaping. So some things are going down while others are going up. The adolescent culture may actually have a greater effect on drug taking behavior than laws do. So adolescents kind of look at it as more acceptable these days. Most adolescents have experimented with drug use and most adolescents in the US can say they can find illegal drugs if they actually wanted to, which is another scary little statistic there. Luckily, most US adolescents don't use drugs regularly and about 25% have never used drugs. 
This is a chart showing drug use by U.S. high school seniors in the past, starting 1975 to 2013. As you can see, everything has pretty much decreased, but notice the red Ritalin, the oranges Vicodin, and that dark green, any other prescription drug. Those didn't even come on the market really until 2001 or so. 2000, 2001, 2005. So that's kind of scary that in this, you know, the last 20 years, new drug abuse has popped up. But the good news is that overall, it's on the decline. Gender differences, again, reinforce, reinforced by what males and females should do. So males buy and use more drugs, but Males and females smoke almost equally in the U.S. Girls actually start to drink alcohol at an earlier age. And, of course, boys with steroids and girls with diet drugs, as we talked about in the last chapter, probably due to poor body image and anxiety over their body image. Tobacco, one of the drugs that we really don't think about as being a drug, but it does. It slows down your growth. It impairs your digestion. It's bad for your nutrition and bad for your appetite. It can actually damage developing hearts, lungs, brains, and reproductive systems. So even though we think of tobacco as harmless, we have shown and studies have shown that it actually is harmful and is a drug. Alcohol is probably the most frequently abused drug. Heavy drinking can impair memory and self-control because it actually damages your brain cells. I'm sure you've heard the commercials or sayings, you know, about how many brain cells you kill when you drink, but it's actually true. And it can damage your prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, which the hippocampus remembers where your memory is at. Prefrontal cortex is where your impulse control and executive planning is at. Adolescents usually deny that they experience any harm or could ever become an alcoholic which is part of the problem because alcohol is so readily available and kind of everywhere. If you look here, every gas station on the corner has alcohol. So when teenagers kind of see this, and it's kind of looked at as a norm, they don't think it's going to hurt them. Marijuana, of course, is another drug that is legal in some states, not legal in others legal in some states if you have a medical card, totally illegal in others. Adolescents who regularly smoke marijuana are more likely to drop out of school, have babies as teenagers, and not be employed. And again, even though they say marijuana is harmless and it helps you sleep, it does impact your memory and your language proficiency and your motivation to do things. <clears throat> So how do we prevent drug abuse? That's the problem. The problem with drug abuse is generational forgetting. Basically what that means is every new generation forgets what the previous generation learned. Every new generation forgets what they went through before. So here we're talking about, we know that these drugs can harm you. We know that alcohol leads to, alcohol abuse leads to alcoholism. We know that tobacco hurts you and can cause cancer, but we seem to forget. So Florida and California actually have ad campaigns that appeal to young, younger, the younger generation. Graphic image ads have a tendency to work, especially with drinking and driving, showing the outcome of drinking and driving. And of course, parental example is huge. You kind of always have to set an example for your kids and our kids kind of have a tendency to look at what we do and look to us for guidance. So parental example is huge. Okay, so that is it for Chapter 10. Hopefully it helped you kind of understand it. All right, bye.